Yo, what is going on? I know, I know. After that explosive episode, Rhaenys and her dragon Maelys, they're done. And they got taken out by Vagar. But they weren't the only ones, as the king himself took a Dracara to the face. And he looks like he got spit roasted too. Aww. Plus, Damon has been having nightmares left and right, and things just get worse as Alice Rivers hands him a nutcracker. All this and more, and I'm super excited to revisit and dissect these moments from this fiery episode of House of the Dragon. All right, folks, look, I hate to be that guy, but here we are. You know the drill. Do me a favor, please, please help me out and hit, give this video a like, please. Look, I know, I know there's a lot of other videos out there, but it'll help me even in 2024 to help this channel grow. HBO's already doing me a big favor by letting me get these episodes early. Hmm. Help me look good to them by giving this video a like when I send them the link. Anyway, into this episode. Look, Rhaenys had a lot of big moments in this episode, right? She's still accepting the fact that her husband is unwilling to name a new heir to Driftmark. And let's be honest. Watching Rhaenys accept her husband's refusal to name an heir is like watching someone accept that their favorite TV show got canceled. And then we find out that she married a dude with a whole side son stashed away like an Easter egg. And then she gets into a battle with Aemon and Vagar and Lost. We see Rhaenys make her way down to the docks where we see they're taking black jobs and she comes across Alan of Tall. Now, this scene right here is deep, right? Because I know at first when I saw her put her hands on Alan's face and say my dude was homely? I was like, Rhaenys, what are you doing? But then before my mind starts wandering too deep, Corliss showed up like Batman with serious dad energy, and I realized this family reunion was way more complicated than I thought. Rhaenys, as usual, does most of the talking with her eyes, but also lets us know that she done been put two and two together. We don't even need to bring Alan to the Game of Thrones Mori for a paternity test. She knows. <laughs> now, I know that this is important, right? I know that this is important, right? But I don't know what it means yet. So let's try to figure out what this could mean, right? Because on one hand, Corliss is kind of in need of an heir. Oh. Ideally a male heir and one who is familiar with the oceans. Alan checks that box. On another hand, we can't help but wonder if Alan's appearance could at some point in the future tie into Sir Laris's dragon, Sea Smoke, who has been seen flying without a rider. But Alan isn't a Targaryen, so by the rules of the game, he shouldn't be able to bond with or ride a dragon. I don't know what this will turn into later, but that was an interesting moment for Rhaenys. And of course, the other big moment comes when Sir Criston and Sir Gwaine pull off an attack on Rook's Rest daring Rhaenyra and her forces to send a dragon to help protect the castle. And this battle is amazing. I mean, it is absolutely everything, especially with all the buildup throughout the episode. That scene at the Black Council when Rhaenyra returns from King's Landing to learn that things have gone from bad to worse is intense. But what made the scene intense is the fact that Rhaenyra feels like she has no other options. Now, I do like the parallels in this episode again. Now, most of the parallels you guys are probably tired of me talking about in the lives. If you're not part of our lives, they're every Sunday night, 10, 15, we're going to be talking about each episode right after. And we go in on all the parallels that were in this episode and how House of the Dragon has been doing this neat trick to what I think is pretty great success. Now, Rhaenys volunteers to ride out to battle Sir Kristen's troops on her dragon, Maelise. And the moment she volunteered, and I heard how the beat dropped in the music. I knew, I knew this was gonna go sideways. And man, oh man, did it get wild. When Aegon gets restless from sitting alone drinking and rides out on his dragon Sunfire, I started sitting up. Aegon's dragon looks adorable and seems like a happy little puppy and most definitely does not look like a fighter. Watching Aegon ride out on Sunfire was like watching a kid try to take on a school bully, right? You admire the courage, but you know this isn't gonna end well. Main Lise, on the other hand, is a beast and starts cooking through Kristen's forces like it's a Tuesday. But then we see Vagar was hiding in the forest under the treetop, and this was all a trap by Kristen. And we should have seen this coming because we saw Aemon and Kristen plotting and strategizing all season long. But I'll be honest. My dumbass dismissed it because I didn't think these two could pull off a half-decent plan together. But this right here, they just put the queen in check. 
But yeah, back to the battle. Even though Aegon is an idiot, and I will admit that he is a brave idiot, or was a brave idiot, I don't know, we'll get to that in a bit, because this guy got rocked. He got out like one Dracarys on Drenice before Sunfire got the business when Maylis put the paws on him. And then Vagar shows up and steals the show like Beyonce at a Coachella after party. I ain't gonna lie. I thought that Vagar came to help Aegon too. R.I.P. to Sunfire. You are basically a participant trophy dragon at this point because Vagar decided to show him what a Dracarys really is. That poor little pup got cooked and exploded. And I like this little fact that when dragons hit the ground, they explode, which I don't know if it makes sense, but it definitely looks cool as hell. Now, I can't tell you how many times I screamed at the TV for Rhaenys to please, please just leave and go back to Dragonstone where it's safe. I can't tell you how many times I gasped, I kicked, and I punched there. Because this moment coming up right here... When Rhaenys and Maylis got in the clear after dodging Bagar's Dracarys, I was like, oh, that's our cute. But Rhaenys had that old look in her eye. You know, the one that heroes get right before they're about to do something stupid. You know, that Jon Snow. And what's wild is that if you pay close enough attention, Aemon wasn't even thinking about her. He wasn't chasing her. He didn't want to know which way she was going. He was just flying over, you know... Sunfire looking down at his handiwork like LeBron after a slam dunk. I like this cool shot that we see of the dragons flying toward each other because we get to see the size up. Maylis is the largest dragon on the side of the blacks and you can see that she only is like maybe half the size of Vagar. But let's be honest, Rhaenys stepping up to fight Aemond and Vagar was like watching someone's retired grandma competing in a dance off with Chris Brown. Like, you admire the bravery, but you know her hips about to get shattered. And Maylis, oh, she gives a good fight. Heck, she even got in some good hits on Vagar and even managed to slam Vagar down on the mat. See, problem though, problem is that Vagar got back up. And I'm curious how many people felt that feeling like, girl, please just walk away things was going too good because Vagar came back and decided to take Maylis's head for that one and Maylis tried yo but Vagar wasn't letting go and that was just too much it was like watching you know a pit bull lock down its jaw and you just know it's not letting go Vagar literally just choked the life out of Maylis leaving Rhaenys to fall and explode oh but that's not all that happened in this episode. We gotta ask ourselves a real serious question. Is Aegon dead? Like, when we see Cole get to Aegon's body, Aemon is already there. He had his sword out. Like, he was like, about to solve this problem. We saw Aemon and Vagar attack Sunfire and then just look down on the body afterward. And then we saw him pick up the dagger that the kings usually carry. I think this is Aegon the Conqueror's dagger. We don't get to see much, but we hear the death rattles of Sunfire as that dragon bleeds out burning hot blood and we see the charred body of Aegon laying on the ground. Now, I think there's a chance they might be alive, but let's think about this because I know that we know that Aemon had every intent in taking out his brother the king. Right? We're on the same page. I mean, he never really saw eye to eye with his brother, no pun intended, because of the way that he was teased as a child. And I know a lot of us look at him and see a mirror of Damon in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, that is true. But one distinguishing difference is that Damon would never intentionally hurt his brother. He would do things out of anger and he would be openly defiant, but Damon had lines that he just wouldn't cross. Amond, on the other hand, has had enough of his brother's bullshit, and that time at the brothel with his boys was the last straw. We saw then that he was hiding out with Vagar, and that he looked up, saw his brother, and chilled back out. Now, he could have flown up right then and there, and then the two of them could have put the Dracarys on Rhaenys, but instead, he let Rhaenys put them paws on Aegon, and then, instead of coming in for the save, 
he went in with the heat and cooked Aegon in the process. Now, we as the audience absolutely knows that Aemon is out here trying to commit fratricide. But does Sir Criston know? Will the people know? What will happen when he returns to King's Landing with the body of his fricasseed brother? We just gotta wait and see. Now, last but not least, I do want to touch on Damon. Damon's dreams are wild. It's like he's living in a Juice World song. All lucid dreams and no sleep. My guy Damon is going through it this episode. We saw him in the beginning of the episode have that moment where he again sees a young Rhaenyra, and this time they're in the throne room in King's Landing. Damon can't understand Rhaenyra's pig Latin, gets frustrated, then cuts off her head. And then the head starts talking. And I appreciate the symbolism, but can we all agree that this is still kind of weird? Now, what I found interesting in this moment is how my man Damon wakes up one time and sees blood on his hands and then wakes up again and the blood is gone. It's a blink and you miss it moment, but my guy woke up twice and I feel like he's starting to feel the weight or the guilt of the decisions he's made. This one feels like he's feeling guilty for, I think, betraying Rhaenyra, and it makes me wonder if maybe I was wrong about this guy, and maybe he's not intending to take the throne and then give it to Rhaenyra. Maybe this time he came to Harrenhal with that actual intention of taking the place for himself. Hmm. And now that he's committed to that plan, it may have been the last thing that finally broke David as he's wrestling with the decision. It's in this moment that Simon Strong tells Damon that Kristen and his army left King's Landing a fortnight ago. It's also in this moment that Damon sees a black goat. Eh, not a good look, buddy. Between the sleep apnea and the demonic farm animals, Damon needs to rethink his decisions. We even see Damon once again trying to get some sleep in rainy ass Harren Hall, and once again my guy hears someone or something outside his room door. And he's quick to investigate. He grabs his sword, he heads out to find what looks like Matt Smith cosplaying as Aemon Targaryen. We then meet this woman again, Alice Rivers, who's up late at night looking sneaky. She comments on how Damon has been having trouble sleeping and Damon, rightfully, wants to know how the hell she knows about his sleep. She explains that the bed that Damon sleeps on is made from a heart tree. Now, if you're a Game of Thrones fan or a Song of Ice and Fire fan, you've definitely seen or heard these mystical trees as related with Bran Stark. A heart tree is a weirwood tree with red leaves and a face carved into its trunk. Followers of the old gods believe that the faces carved into the heart trees allow the old gods to see and hear their prayers. These faces were originally carved by the children of the forest, the original inhabitants of Westeros, and continued by the first men. Now that we explained that, let's get back to it. Alice hands Damon a Coney Island nutcracker that she says will knock him out faster than a dragon with a belly full of sheep. We don't actually see him drink the drink, but we hear the gulp sound effect and then we see Damon waking up in the middle of a meeting with Sir William Blackwood. Damon has his own little hangover moment and is trying to fake the punk and piece together what the hell is going on. Hmm. Suddenly, Damon sees one of his deceased wives. Damn, that's messed up that I got to say one of them. Anyway, we see his ex-wife walking through the room as a cup bearer. You know, the person who refills the drinks. Which is interesting as this is the role that Rhaenyra had for the small council when she was younger. So it's some cool parallels and symbolism there. We see he's hallucinating as the Blackwoods are promising to help. But only after Daemon and Caraxes help take care of the Brackens once and for all. And those were the major developments in this episode between Rhaenys... Damon and that whole battle with the dragons we are in the end game now and this is crazy because we're only four episodes into the season we're only at the midway point and I can't help but wonder where things go from here book readers don't ruin it for us in the comments everyone else let me know what you guys think is going to happen next I can't wait to see you guys on the lives uh join us again next week when we do this next breakdown for the following episode otherwise hey give this video a like and I'll check you all later Peace.